from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the uh, head of the Near East section here in the Library of Congress's African and Middle Eastern Division. Um, the division consists of uh, three sections. Uh, the African section, uh, whose focus is on Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section, whose focus is on Hebraica and Judaica worldwide. And the Near East section, of which I'm head. On behalf of uh, all of my colleagues in the division, and particularly our chief, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, I wish you welcome. These uh, continuing lectures uh, given at noon are part of the division's outreach. Um, the division, as you noted from the description, has a very broad um, purview covering some 78 nations. Uh, the Near East section of which I'm head uh, basically covers the entire Arab world, uh, Turkey, uh, the Caucasus, uh, former Soviet Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Muslims in Western China, uh, Russia, and the Balkans. Uh, we, as the Hebraic section, are custodial, meaning we hold collections of the local language materials, and they range well, they total about 480,000 volumes, of which approximately one half are in Arabic, and there are 75,000 approximately volumes in Persian and in Turkish and Ottoman Turkish. And uh, our smallest collection of materials is in Ingush, a language of the North Caucasus, uh, of which we have 12 volumes. However, that equates to a 33 and a third percent growth over last year when we only had nine. Uh, beyond the uh, materials held here and uh, made accessible for researchers, the uh, specialist and reference librarians who are charged with developing the collection from and about what I've just described as the Near East reside here and work here. And it is through their efforts that we generally find the individuals who uh, give these noontime lectures. And in this case, uh, our senior reference librarian for Arabic, Noel Kawar, has uh, found uh, Mr. Tahir. And now I'm going to ask Noel to come forward and introduce today's speaker. Good afternoon. And thank you very much all for coming, joining us today oh. okay. for this important lecture about a particularly significant monument in humanity's history. We are fortunate to have a lecturer who has lived part of his life in the city where that monument existed, that is Alexandria, Egypt. Mr. Al Tahir is a retired official of the government of Canada. He is presently an adjunct lecturer with the Canadian Foreign Service Institute and was also a former lecturer at the universities of Ottawa, Carleton, and Calgary. Mr. Al Tahir, who speaks five languages Arabic, English, French, Italian, and German, graduated first from the Christian Brothers French schools in Cairo, Egypt and eventually obtained a BA in Political Studies and International Relations from the American University of Beirut, then an MBA in Aviation Management with distinction from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in the USA. He is a published writer and has just released a book earlier this year under the title Aviation and Maritime Security Intelligence. For many years prior to coming first to the USA in 1978, then to Canada in 1981, he lived and worked in Egypt, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Libya, 
Tunisia and Morocco, though his working career has taken him over 35 countries. Aside from his multi-dimensional professional career, Mr. Tahir's life has an additional cultural angle. He offers public lectures on cross-cultural aspects of the history and religions of the Eastern Mediterranean, Arab and North African countries to public as well as specialized groups. He is a member of the Canadian Institute for Mediterranean Studies. He is also a member of the Middle East Studies Association, MESA, in the USA, as well as the American Society for Industrial Security. He is a co-founder of the Canadian Institute for Middle Eastern Research in Calgary, as well as the Forum of Alexandria in Ottawa. Without further ado, Mr. Al-Tahir, over yours. Thank you very, very much, Noel. Now they know everything about me. <laughs> Believe me, nothing is hiding. We heard some music at the beginning, and that music has been detected immediately by Mrs. Mary, Mary Jane Deep, who is the, the boss of this place, and because she also lived in the city of Alexandria. And those who know that kind of music and this instrument are either people who grew up in Alexandria or people or they're the, the, the grandparents of people who lived in Istanbul, Constantinople, in the old Pera era. And uh, this, uh, this music box, which you see in the picture here, is called Laterna. And uh, they used, whether in Alexandria or in Constantinople, they used to go around the coffee houses and uh, stop in front of people or bars, and then they would play and people would give them some money. Uh, this has existed until about the uh, mid-60s, but then it doesn't exist anymore. So it's quite, by itself, it's quite a historic part of this, of this whole thing of Alexandria. Uh, I would like to talk today about the, uh, the old library, and I would like to talk about the new library. And depending how time is going to, to, to deal with us, we will have, uh, inshallah, hopefully, a little bit of time for uh, question answers where, for those who are interested. Now, the, uh, talking about the, uh, yes, okay. you see, when we talk about Egypt, we think always of ancient Egypt. We think sometimes of Islamic Egypt or Coptic Egypt, but we hardly th talk very much about Greek Egypt and the, the uh, the, uh, by, uh, the, the Greeks who were in Egypt were not just in Alexandria because they were all over the country and they spread all over it with time and so on and they became part and parcel of Egyptian society with their own culture. Most of them spoke Arabic and many of them did not at the same time. So this is the importance of the Greeks. So let's assume we are today in Alexandria looking west toward the Mediterranean Sea, as you see in the picture here. And then all of you, you see the sun setting, like in, uh, in this image. But then as you move your face towards the city, you will see rising in front of you an imposing mass, another sun, the mass of another sun. But this sun is reincarnated as a temple of knowledge, uh, whose real foundations were laid 2,300 years ago. The new, this is, ladies and gentlemen, the new library of Alexandria. Now, the city of Alexandria, which home of the famous wonder of the world, the lighthouse, as we all know, which for many centuries was the cultural center of the Western world, was built, as we all know, by Alexander the Great in about 332 BC, and became the seat of power of the Greek Ptolemies, who were the rulers of Egypt at, the, at that time. Now, by the time Alexander set foot in Egypt, Egyptian civilization was already some 3,000 years old. The pyramids of the Old Kingdom were already over 2,000 years old. And while the magnificence of King Tut, King Tutankhamun, 
had faded and passed a millennium before. So you see, if you try to look at it from the time perspective, there is no way you can really establish within parameters how old that could be. It, it's very old, as simple as that. Uh, now, most of us take it for granted that two cities, Athens and Rome, completely dominated the classical world. In fact, there was a third city that, at its height, dwarfed both of these in wealth and population, as well in scientific and artistic achievements. While Greece and Rome spread their influence through trade and war, this city set out to on another adventure. That not at the point of a sword, but on the tip of a pen. The triumph was to be a conquest of the mind, rather of goods and, and, uh, and uh, physical, physical things, and not led by legions of soldiers, by, by dynasties of scholarly people navigating on a sea of books. This was the importance of the library of Alexandria. Most modern scholars are inclined to credit Ptolemy the first Soter uh, for establishing both the library, because they had two, they, which is the, the Bruchion, and then you have the Museion, or the Shrine of the muse, Muses. So there was two of them, and I will explain why at that time. And this took place in 295 BC. Just between brackets, I met a, 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 a wonderful English speaker who said, do you know, guys, ladies and gentlemen, what does BC means? It means before computer. <laughs> and do you know what AD means? He says, awaiting digitization. <laughs> Keep that in mind. It's fun. Now, this is, this is how the library is supposed to have looked like. And uh, according to Christian Jacob, who is a, the author of the book called Alexandria in the third century BC, and I'm quoting here, the Library of Alexandria was the first attempt at, ex at collecting all that existed at, the time, at, that, uh, at that time in terms of human knowledge. Now, this outlook was completely different from prevailing outlooks in Athens at that time. In Athens, an antique book w had no value per se unless it represented a certain value for the present. So if it has no value, then we don't collect it. We don't put it on, in our holdings. In Alexandria, however, the idea was to collect everything that was written in the past, even if they did not agree with its content, or even if it did not represent a particular interest at that time. Now, independently from the intrinsic value of the work at hand, they retained the item and translated it into Greek because many of these items were in Aramaic, in Hebrew, in whatever languages of the old world. Now, as, as its name spread, many noted scholars took up residence in the library. Among them, let me cite just a few of major importance. Herophilus, the father of anatomy. All of that, of course, two to 300 years BC, so I'm not going to to, to list the, the dates. So, Herophilus, father of anatomy, Euclid, the great geometer, Eratosthenes, who calculated the circumference of the Earth, 284 BC, imagine, Callimachus, the grammarian, poet, and father of librarianship. So, if you have a degree in library science, you have studied about Callimachus and what he did at the Library of Alexandria. You have Aristar Aristarchus of Samothrace, who was first to theorize that the Earth revolved around the Sun. Hipparchus was the first to accurately compute the length of the solar year. Then you get Claudius Ptolemy, the father of cartography, and by his time it was agreed that the world was spherical in shape. So it's not flat anymore, it's round during the Greeks, not, not in, not in uh, Middle Ages of Europe. The idea of measuring the world by dividing it into vertical and horizontal lines had been used by this gentleman, er Erastos Erastothenes, when he made his astonishingly, astonishingly accurate measurement of the Earth's circumference. 
And then it was Ptolemy in his book, Geography, which you can certainly find reproduced in this library and other libraries. You can borrow it from the university library. He developed the idea into the notions of longitudes and latitudes based on what our friend Eratosthenes did. And including the division into, into degrees and minutes. So it's not only just longitude and latitude, but even the, 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 uh, the, uh, the little measurements in between all of that. Finally, it was at the Library of Alexandria that the Old Testament was translated from Aramaic and Hebrew into Greek. And this is the beginning of the entrance of the, the, uh, the holy books uh, before Islam into the modern world. Now, the overwhelming number of manuscripts in the library prompted the building of a major annex outside. You remember I said at the beginning there is more than one. Uh, they built something called the Serapium, and the Serapium was nicknamed the Doter Library. There is the big library, the Museon, and then there was the Doter Library. Why? This, you'll see now. The Serapium housed excellent quality copies, not originals, of everything that they had in the Museon, which kept only the originals. So they were far sighted. There is no hard drives in, at that time in order to, 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 uh, to bookmark the books or uh, to, to save them, but they did copy it by hand on parchment and scrolls and kept it just in case something happened to the original. Uh, now, the, uh, let me talk about their classification system under the Greeks. The father of book classification in libraries is probably Kolimachus, as I said, who classified every field of learning as they were there then known. He organized them in tables or pinnacles in Greek. That's how they're called. His basic method of classification was by subject, by subject. Think of Dewey and the Library of Congress classification system. So and let's see where it all comes from and started. He, now, what are the subjects? Comedy, epic, history, law, lyrics, poetry, mathematics, medicine, natural science, rhetoric, tragedy, and miscellanies, different other things. Under each subject, individual authors were arranged in alphabetical order. Each name was followed by a short bibliographical notice and critical account of the author's writings. And by the middle of the first century BC, the library contained perhaps as many as 700,000 manuscripts on scrolls or papyrus. Don't forget the Greeks were in papyrus land, which is Egypt, as we all know. The pin now, here is something interesting. The pinnacles, those tables they created, uh, uh, became a model and have eventually influenced librarians in the Middle Ages. And it was eventually borrowed by the famous 10th century Arab scholar Ibn Nadim, who produced his famous work Al Fehrist, or Index, which has fortunately reached us intact. So what happened is that the table of contents of the old Greek library, and we all know that what happened to the Greek library, it was destroyed because of wars and this and that, but the table of contents survived through the translation that was made eventually and event on, in other languages, then into Arabic, and from Arabic it went into Latin with the presence of the Muslim dynasties in Spain in, for about 750 years. So that's how the transfer of technology happened and how we know today what did the Library of Alexandria contain in terms of books and manuscripts because we never got anything left of that library, unfortunately. It was also thanks to this Arabic translation that Claudius Ptolemy's book on geography was discovered. Uh, the book was lost since the fall of Alexandria in about AD 1300, when the Arabic translation was discovered at that time. So that's how they got to know about that. Now, at the time of the Library of Alexandria, it was not the only library in, the, in that existing world. There were other well-known libraries, like in Nineveh, which is in Iraq today, 
or in Pergamum, in Turkey, or in Rome itself under the Roman, so there were other libraries. But because of the philosophy behind the Library of Alexandria, that library survived. Some things were eventually borrowed or received from the other libraries, including some like gift from, uh, from the, one of the Roman emperors who fell in love with Cleopatra to his beloved, and then they put it in the Library of Alexandria. Now, you can read a lot about that. Speaking of reading, I have a list of about nine reference books, which uh, you are welcome to have. And if you give your email address, I will send you that by email. And then this way, you can, if you are interested in the subject, you can read more about it. Some old, some not so old. Now, then they, it was decided that we are, have to build a new library. And that was in about seven, 1970s, a professor at the University of Alexandria called Mustafa Abedi uh, came up with the idea. And uh, I had a correspondence with him. And eventually, he did some research uh, with UNESCO and so on. Let me, let me take things in order. So the, uh, the idea then uh, took, was taken over by the University of Alexandria from Dr. Abadi. And in 74, or already since that time, a hand-picked international jury of architects and librarians, interesting, they put them together, which is you can't work on, on some subject matter without talking to the experts, not just the experts in construction, but those who know how this place is going to be used. Otherwise, it's useless to build buildings that don't help what we are going to do. You, you need a lot of stacks to store all these books. So anyway, so they started looking for a design that symbolized a meeting of past and present, of the local and the universal. This is what the builders had in mind. In September 1988, an international competition was launched by UNESCO, the United Nations Educational and Scientific Organization and Cultural Organization, and the International Union of Architects to find a design that would rise to the architectural challenge. So in 89, the winning design, chosen from more than 500 entries from 77 countries from around the world was produced by an architectural firm and landscape uh, company from Norway called Snoeta, which has an office in New York City, as a matter of fact. And uh, Snoeta, uh, the, the design was awarded the prize for the past construction design in the world for the year 2000 at that time. Seven architects, including Norwegians, two Americans, an Austrian, and a Czech, and two landscape architects, as well as several consultants from all over the world, worked on the project along with an Egyptian construction consortium. As a matter of fact, there was one Canadian from a town, a small city in Ontario, who was chosen just to do the measurements and the style of windows that are going to put that. And when I gave that lecture the first time, just, just before the library was inaugurated, he was in the audience and we pointed to him and he stood up and everybody. But he did not mess up with the loudspeaker, like I did. The, now, the, the real challenge was to define the concept of the new library in both its architectural perspective and its intellectual mission while profiling its past glory. Now, while the no less famous Lighthouse of Alexandria guided ships to the safe haven of its harbor, the ancient library guided people to the temple of knowledge. The new library was designed with the same objective. So if you look at uh, these comparative pictures, one is the, on top is the artist rendition of how the library could have looked like with the little bay or the small harbor, the um, eastern harbor as it's called in Alexandria, and the, the same location where the library is today, it's behind us in this picture, and looking at the uh, jetty and the location of the ancient pharos where today you have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fort of Kaif Bay, the Memluk uh, fort of Kaif Bay. And there have been several, um, several uh, 
underwater exploratory works done specifically by Jean-Yves Empereur, uh, the French, uh, uh, the French uh, archaeologist, to try and find the remains of the, li the uh, lighthouse. They found a few things, but nothing really corroborated the fact or confirmed that this is really the remains of the lighthouse. Now, let's look at symbolism here. The architects who designed the new library wanted the new building to have the following. They wanted the design to symbolize a meeting of past and present. You see, architecture is like painting. It's like a symphony. When you write it, you have to live it. You have to imagine so many things at the same time. So when you bring them together and you play them or you paint them, it all has a meaning, not just individual scenes and so on. And uh, this is what they're doing. So a meeting of past and present, the local and the universal, so Egypt and the rest of the region, while rising to the architectural challenge of providing in one structure a functional library, an inviting public building, and a monument to civilization. To be monumental because of the power of the ideas represented by its history, and at the same time to evoke Egypt's great monuments through massive scale, but simplicity at the same time, which is the most important feature of the new design as we will see in the coming slides. Finally, they wanted it to be deliberately timeless and contain associations from different cultures during different periods of time. Now, how to turn all these ambitions into a building? The prize-winning design features a cylindrical building set in a pool. Ta-da! And the cylinder's gridded glass roof, and uh, which is that? Sorry, I don't have one of those. The gridded glass roof here, you have windows through all these things, through all these um, open, uh, apertures. You have windows that go, and we will see it from inside too. The cylinder's uh, gridded glass roof slants downwards until part of it disappears below the uh, ground level, as you can see in that picture you have in front of you. The library complex is built on a, 45, on a about 500,000 square feet site, and the cylinder itself com that comprises the main building is about 1,700 square feet in diameter. The roof itself, the outside roof, resembles a giant microchip, but its singular plan also echoes the hieroglyph Ra of the sun god. You see the red, the red sun god sign on, on, his, on the head of the pharaoh, on Horus' head. This is another symbol of ancient Egypt in there. Now, about two-thirds of the building, as I said before, is surrounded by water. The level surface of the pool emphasizing, emphasizes the tilting motion of the structure and provides dynamic reflections of the walls, which I'm going to talk about. The water also serves as a cooling device for the air conditioning system, and they have chosen specific types of plants and algae that are self-cleaning for the pool, so they don't have to keep emptying it and do vacuum cleaning. Uh, luckily, we don't have to do that. So the, the plants do that for us. And it also contains, the, the, under the water, you have spotlights that turn on at light, and the spotlights are arranged in such a way that they represent the constellation in the sky as they were at the time of the ancient library. So they did the astronomical research, and when you see the, the lights, you think this is how the sky looked like in those days before Christ. Amazing. They tell you when there is a will, there is a way. These guys had a will and they did the impossible with nothing on hand. They had nothing in those days. Now, what does the library complex contain today? The library complex uh, contains a conference center, or actually a few of them, not just one. It has a planetarium, which is that round uh, um, football-sized uh, uh, ball, which is the planetarium there. It also includes an international center for information studies and a center for documentation and research. 
next to the planetarium, there is an exploratorium, that's how they call it, which contains hands-on, specifically for children, interactive exhibits as an educational medium. So that's right under the, uh, the planetarium. Now, there is an archaeological museum of ancient Egypt. Then you find a calligraphy institute, and as we, most of us know in this room, the, 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 uh, cal uh, Arabic calligraphy is beautiful, and the Arabic, whether we understand Arabic or not, it's beautiful decorations, and many ladies who go to the Middle East, Dubai in particular, they buy a little necklace with their name written in Arabic in 21 or 22 karat gold. So that's, that's worth the trip. And uh, then they have a manuscript uh, museum and a conservation and restoration laboratory as should be, as should be fit a major uh, library. Now, there are various special and private collections that were donated to the library, and one of them in particular of Muhammad Awad, collections of Alexandrian archives. Uh, somehow he collected some wonderful things, whether from the municipalities, from architects, from old finds, or from reproductions about the structures and the, uh, the municipal services in that city over the ages wonderful things to see, and he donated that to the library. Uh, there, is, uh, there is another one also uh, donated by uh, Shadi Abdel Salam. Shadi Abdel Salam is a well-known Egyptian Arab uh, movie director, and he produced many, uh, many well-known movies in the regions in the 1960s. And you can go there and watch his movies inside the library, at, as he, on a, sometimes on a uh, on a computer or a TV set, or sometimes they have a major viewing uh, for the overall public. The, uh, the library also has a children's library. Well, let me, let me explain something about this, which you can see also in New York. Uh, this calligraphic panel or strip, this is part of the Kaaba. Kaaba being the cubic building that's at the center of Mecca, which is covered by a dark green kind of curtain that is changed every year. And there is a, um, a workshop in the city of Mecca, that's in Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, full with people, Turkmen, and people from Central Asia, whose specialty to spend the whole year uh, doing the, uh, the, the, all the, um, what do you call that? The embroidery, all the embroidery, all the embroidery in gold thread. And it has all kinds of appropriate Quranic verses and about life and God and the supremacy of God. And you, you, know, you know what religious shrines do have. And uh, the most important part or the biggest part is the cover to the door that leads inside the Kaaba. Kaaba doesn't have anything inside it because that was a relic from the old uh, uh, atheist uh, and idolatric times of Arabia before Islam, Christianity, and Judaism made their appearance in that part of the world. So they have a beautiful carpet, all designed like that, and every year the government of Saudi Arabia would donate parts of this, uh, um, of this curtain and the door uh, curtain to chiefs of states or important organizations. If you go to New York City, to the United Nations General Secretariat, you will see one of those original covers of the door of the Kaaba, and it is exquisite. The trick is to, if they, I don't remember if they had an explanation in English of what does it say in Arabic, because what's the use if you can't understand what it says? But if you go and you don't find an explanation, ask the guide, where can we get an, a translation of that? Because maybe they will think of that. It's, uh, it's worthwhile to read. Uh, speaking briefly about Kaaba, you see, you know Muslims go for Hajj every, every year, if they can, if they can afford it, health-wise, money-wise, and they go and do their prayer there and go around it. If we were today in Alexandria, what are the programs being offered at the library? There is one ongoing program for several semesters called Hellenism, Judaism, and Christianity in Alexandria. It's a three-month program that you can follow there at the library. They have a program on introduction to Greek culture. 
They have a course on human rights. They also host a lot of scientific and economic and cultural uh, programs uh, with people who are from outside the library, but they just uh, uh, join together in doing it. And uh, these days they have the first international Coptic studies conference, which is an important thing since Egypt is a balance between Copts and Muslims. And Okay, like everyone, well, they have a, a children, a children uh, wing where children can go and do their own thing. I will talk also a little bit more about children in Egypt in particular. And they have a cafeteria, a beautiful cafeteria, which is run actually by the Hilton chain. I don't know why, but it's the Hilton chain. Uh, they run it. They have beautiful um, uh, espresso and meal ferry. So if you love that or you wanted a luncheon, you just go there and have a beautiful view of the Mediterranean right in front of you. Wonderful place. We talked, well, I said something about the outer wall. The outer wall, as you can see it here, and I'll, I'll, make it, I'll bring it close up, the massive outer wall of the library is patterned with calligraphic carvings. And uh, these carvings are in most of the world's written languages living and dead, and they produce a texture resembling Egypt's striated Nile side cliffs along the Nile, especially in Upper Egypt, which is the south of Cairo. So this is supposed to see, and you'll see all these calligraphic things, and depending on your culture, and which language you speak or read, you can find it represented on that wall. Now the interesting thing also you notice, on the side of that pool around the wall, they planted something particularly uh, not impressive, but um, that speaks much better about the library. They print papyrus reeds. So you have real papyrus reeds growing there. I know you can buy them by the pyramids and they can do them for you or in front of you, but here you see the real green plant uh, and how it looks like. So that was very thoughtful on their part. The interior of the building consists of seven primary and 14 secondary levels in the form of terraces. Uh, the stepping of the floor plan avoids the claustrophobic effect common to some libraries around the world. And then this way, remember the windows, and then you can see directly through those windows at your level, out to the, to the sea. Uh, the view within the interior is not obscured by the height of the book stacks. Uh, as each terrace has viewing platforms to allow for an obstructed view of the sea, which I have already said. As a vanity project, the library should have little trouble doing for Alexandria what the Pan Pacific Center did for Vancouver. For those who don't know Vancouver, the Pan Pacific Center of Vancouver or the Opera House did for Sydney, or the Burj Khalifa did for Dubai. The moment you see the structure like the, the, tower, the uh, Eiffel Tower, you know exactly where you are. You don't have to guess. So they, uh, eventually the library could possibly uh, see that. But because behind the library, they still have parts of the buildings of the campus of the University of Alexandria, uh, it kind of dwarfs the building, but you can't, uh, you can't demolish a university unless you give them another uh, campus that is worthwhile. Already they took part of the gardens of the university to build the library. So the, uh, I pro certainly they had to get the Egyptian uh, ruling elite uh, get involved in that to, for it to happen. Now, talking about collections, consisting of 11 stories and three stories underground, totaling over 743 square feet of space, the library focuses on building collections in four areas, about the ancient library itself, about Alexandria, about Egypt, and about the world of knowledge. That's why they try to collect as much as possible that is meaningful from all over the world. And the world has been helping, as I will mention. Now, as the library was built, the technology has changed, and you don't always only have books on shelves in stacks, 
or photocopies of book, you have to digitize. So they had to go back and digitize at least the most important things electronically and link them to the World Wide Web. And uh, you can go into the website of the library, uh, which I can give it to you if, if you wish, and you can go into the, uh, the holdings, the catalog, and pick books you like. And uh, if it's the only copy in the whole world, you can get it through ILL, Interlibrary Loan, and that will be useful for resources. Otherwise, why not go to Alexandria? It's fun. Lots of good swimming. So, digitizing and the storage of title electronic link to the World Wide Web gives vast potential capacity to an international library with ambition to become, like its predecessor, universal. The, the transfer of manuscripts and rare books onto optical disks will guarantee a more lasting conservation of, uh, of books. Imagine the scribes, how many hundreds of years they had to spend in order to copy from the old languages. Now, some of uh, uh, many libraries around the world, including our hosts here, have been cooperating with the Library of Alexandra before day one, it is pre-opening, and uh, they were supportive uh, both financially and, uh, and uh, from the point of view of training, the point of view of sharing technology and bringing Egyptian librarians to come and be trained at this library as did Canada and so many other countries around the world. And uh, for instance, one of the things is that the library here has some Arabic manuscripts. You know, everything was written by hand. So some of the scientific, poetic, or scientific treatises written by the Arabs uh, uh, during their history were handwritten. We've called all kinds of uh, illuminations and so on, like the old uh, Bibles. Uh, some of these documents are in this library here in Washington, D.C. And if you want to know more about them, you talk to Dr. Fauzi Tadrus, who is here with us. Fauzi, where are you? He's right there. Stand up, please. This is the man to talk to if you want to know what's going on here in terms of, it's not a commercial for the library. This is the real, the real McCoy. Now, currently, the Library of Alexandria holds close to half a million items, including books, rare manuscripts, maps, and so on. And it is targeted to contain five to eight million volumes by the year 2020. And they, they have also several websites. So one will lead you to the other, the main one, bibalix.org, which I will give to you later. And then you have CultNet and Eternal Egypt, and it's an amazing array of things which they keep up to date. And through my dealing with the library as an outside reader or interested party, uh, I was surprised to see the level of sophistication when it comes to the, using the English language. And they are not, there are some expatriates from Europe, North, the United States and so on, but most of the young people who work there are Egyptian girls and boys or men and women and uh, fantastic work they do over there. Now, the world did not leave the library alone. The total cost of the library was $230 million, and it took 11 years to complete. UNESCO, which helped save the temple of Abu Simbel, remember those with gray hair like me? When, when they went out in Upper Egypt and saved the temples, took them up the cliff, well, they did the same thing uh, by raising interest and awareness and money for the Library of Alexandria. And if you look like that, this is UNESCO and the countries, not in any particular order, that have supported Egypt by a variety of things. Some directly financially, others did it by providing training or equipment, or uh, uh, the, the uh, Germans provided the system of bringing the book and returning them to the stacks electronically. So they travel, you don't have to go somebody to pick it up as we used to do in older days. Uh, another thing that has been going on in the world since the library was inaugurated, they have something called the Friends of the Library of Alexandria. And in every country, in the United States, there is several of them, particularly in California, 
some on the East Coast, some in the, uh, in, um, in, in the Midwest, who have a group of people who would meet, talk about the Library of Alexandria, organize lectures, collect money or books in support of the library itself. And I think this is great. <coughs> Excuse me. For the Egyptian workers, I'm going to be closing down slowly now. For the Egyptian workers and international consultants who worked on the project and for millions of Egyptians, the recreation of the 2300 year old Alexandria Library is a great source of national pride. Everybody is proud that he or she put their hand in it. The beauty of the project lies in the leap from an intrinsically Greek library to a repository of multiple layers of knowledge. This knowledge is manifested through meticulously preserved ancient Egyptian papyrus next to innovative Greek treatises in philosophy, arts, and sciences. And an in, what I, I call an integrative Arab, cult, Arab culture that integrated several things together. Why integrative? Because it integrated a knowledge that blossomed from a triple religious uh, heritage, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, captivating European, Turkish, and Asiatic influenced and buttressed by modern technological wizardry. And this is what they have put all together. And uh, the beauty of culture is when you feel that you are part of it all and it is part of you, even if you don't speak the language, but you learn about it. And uh, to say that I am this or that and pigeonhole ourselves is not sufficient in the new world where we are now, have, we go on picnics in Mars. I'm going to be too far here. But we are getting there to an impossible world and we have to be ready intellectually and scientifically to, to live in that world. Look at the uh, space station. They are not only Americans or Russians or Chinese. They have with them Europeans and they have all kinds of people. Now, there, there are stark differences though between the ancient world and the age of DVD, Bluetooth, iPods and Blackberries and so on. Today, knowledge is not, is not just the domain of the select few. We are no more in an age where only a handful of people can read and write. Today, there is so much information and knowledge that some of us do not know what to do with it. And some of us, or some of our countries, try to curb this knowledge from being disseminated, which is a big loss to humanity. And uh, in, uh, in our self-righteousness, we, we think that limiting the flow of knowledge will allow us to better control the people. But if we can better control the people for a limited period of time, those same people are going to make up no matter what. And the result will be something like Arab Springs or this or that, but hopefully it works the way we hope it works, not the way it evolves in some places. Come think of it, nobody has a monopoly on knowledge. No one ideology, no one religion, no one political system, and no one political discourse can claim that it has the answer to everything. It is the collective diversity of human thinking that makes us who we are. Tomorrow's users of the library are today's school children. For them to fully benefit from its potential, they need to be trained into using libraries at school and in the community as part of the learning process all the way to university and beyond. Well, if this is the case in Canada, the United States, and most European countries, in some other countries, it is still not necessarily a reality uh, everywhere, where hundreds, there are seven, many countries where there is no library in their schools, and uh, they don't encourage having library in their school. Kids don't learn that they have to go and do some research, B learn the process of borrowing a book that does not belong to them, look after it, benefit from it, maybe share its content, and return it in one piece without frying eggs on it, and at the same time, 
to, to when they grow up, they know that at university, they also have to do research. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of universities that don't have research. They don't do any research. They memorize what they learn in books, they recite it in the exam, then they come with PhDs. I don't know how they do that, but that's what happens in parts of our world. In the world of finance, what do we say? We say that money creates money, and which is true. I guess I can use the same metaphor and say that knowledge creates knowledge. And the more we know, the more we realize that we don't know. And hence, we have to look for more because knowledge is power. And sometimes when I give my training program or my pre-deployment or pre-posting program at the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canada, I say, any little thing you know about the culture or the religions or whatever in the country you are assigned to, you may not know the whole detail, but you just mention the name that you are aware about that, your interlocutor who will assume at the beginning that you are tabula rasa, as John Locke would put it, you don't know anything, that you are, you really know something about them and they will pay attention to you. And I say, and this is knowledge is power. So that's what, why you have to, to know. Now, modern times may have caught up with Alexandria, the once romantic lady of famous writers such as Lawrence Durrell, Constantine Cavafy, or E.M. Forster. But the special dreams it has always conjured in the imagination of the people of Egypt and the world are still there. When you hear Alexandria, even Alexandria, Virginia, I understand we have a representative from the Library of, Ale Library of Alexandria, Virginia. Are they here? There they are. Alexandria, Virginia. That's the closest to Alexandria, Egypt you can get. So the, uh, the, 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 more, the more these uh, people get to, to visit and see the Alexandria of today, especially those who lived in it today, uh, they are more willing to help the library, as a matter of fact. After all, Alexandria has never been just a city. It was and has always remained a symbol of learning, freedom, youth, happiness, and love. Alexandria, especially during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, used to be the California of Egypt. What you don't do on the East Coast or somewhere in some more regulated conservative state, you do it in California. So, Egypt is a bit, Alexandria is a bit of California. Was. In the, in the midst of the stormy intellectual and political discourse enveloping the region in, those day, in these days, Egypt's continued commitment to the library will reflect a commitment to, in, to intellectual freedom. And that's very important to watch and really make sure that they continue on that because without opening their eyes that the world is watching, not just Cairo and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also the educational and learning institutions, they will tend to forget about that. It's important for them, it's important for us too. With the library as a launching pad, perhaps Alexandria will succeed in reclaiming its former position as a pantheon of knowledge and a center for multiculturalism and diversity. Or as Lawrence Durrell described it, the home of five races, five languages, and 12 faiths. My dear friends, by resurrecting the Library of Alexandria, Egypt has set up its own challenge. It set up my own challenge. I got the Library of Congress card yesterday. I didn't get the chance to scan it here, but I will. The Library of Alexandria is a major project of major cultural and historical significance, which is the title of this talk. Now it has to live up to it. However, by inviting us all to be her partners, that is Egypt and the library, in this enterprise, and by us accepting the challenge, the challenge has become ours too. Thank you very much. We have a few questions.
uh, few minutes for questions and anyone who will be asking a question, it will be webcasted, which means you will be giving permission to the library to webcast your question. I will ask uh, Hassan or Mr. Taher to repeat the question so everybody would know what you are asking. If I hear it, because there is no traveling microphone. Yeah. So, any question, ma'am? About what, sorry? Jewish prayer, lecture, were totally incorrect. They got a good laugh, but they were incorrect. My father did it through fashion. Okay, noted. Taken. Uh, this is the first time I get a negative comment about those, actually. And I, uh, uh, I was on it one of the. It was a case of misinformation, complete yeah. misinformation. Uh, actually, let me, let me just finish it. Well taken. And for you to characterize it in the way you do it is completely disrespectful. Uh, I, I don't think it was meant to be like that. But I had one of the audience was a rabbi. And at the end of one of my lectures, he said, Hassan, I would have given that same presentation the way you gave it. So I consider that to be kosher to say, if I can use the term. Anyway, people are free to say what they want. Any other questions? Sir. I, I didn't know that important detail, but is there anything published about it? Yeah. Repeat what he said. Yeah, he said that the, uh, the whole idea of the Library of Alexandria actually germinated first here in this library, and then it was passed on or shared with the Egyptians, correct? And uh, my question to him is that, has there been anything, because I have never read, uh, read that anywhere, uh, anything written or in an article or something that we could refer to in that? Okay. I see your point. I see your point. So anyway, it started here. Now I have to do the homework and do the research and find out who started here. Any more questions? Sir. As you notice, I did not get into that particular dicey subject. Uh, and the references I have will clarify lots of things. There has been a, a general say that the library was, was destroyed over various phases. <clears throat> the real destruction happened during the war between Julius Caesar and Cleopatra when parts of the storage spaces of the library burned because of warfare at the time. And then eventually what happened is that when Christianity came to Egypt and the people became Christianized, they did, that before Islam, they were not very happy with any teachings that are against Christian creed. So they wanted to get rid of that and they say, now there is no corroboration in writing. Like if you put that to, to the FBI, for an investigation, they will have a hard time trying to establish truth from, uh, from mythology. So anyway, they say that the Christians contributed to the destruction of part of the library. Then there is another story that says, oh, when the Muslims and the Arabs came to Egypt, they, uh, the, the commander, Ibn al-As, Amr ibn al-As, was asked by some of the people in Egypt, including uh, Egyptian Christians, what are you going to do with what's left of the library? We have no idea what was left, 
what was left, what does it mean in terms of quantities or quality of material? And in, may, in several books, and one in particular, they tell you that uh, there were so many, uh, oh, uh, the, the commander of the Arab forces said, I cannot decide on the future of these books, but I have to ask my, my boss. And his boss was the Caliph Omar, and he had to refer to him. So he sent a message to Caliph Omar to ask, we found these documents, what do we do with them? And the story goes that Caliph Omar told him, more or less in, those, in, this, in these words, the, uh, he said that if these papers, uh, these scrolls, agree with Islam, there is no point in duplicating things, burn them. If these things are contradictory to Islam, we don't want them around, burn them. And then the conclusion was that the, uh, they, it took six months to burn what's left of the Library of Alexandria in 4,000 public baths in Alexandria. Now, you know something that's a bit exaggerated by the numbers. In those days, uh, about 600-something, uh, uh, there were no 4,000 public baths in Alexandria because perhaps the population of Alexandria was close to 4,000. So, no corroboration. And they rely on one person whose name is Gamal al-Din ibn al-Qifti, who was an Egyptian, and they say that ibn al-Qifti was the originator of that story. But nobody got to know much about ibn al-Qifti or corroborate that he was the author of the story or it was a, a, a fabrication. I have with me a very interesting article. It's not an article, actually. It's a... Uh, it's an article, okay, in the New York Review of Books. And you have Bernard Lewis. We all, most of us know who Bernard Lewis is. He and a couple more thinkers were writing and responding to each other on the pages of the uh, review about the, uh, the destruction of the uh, Library of Alexandria. And Sir Bernard Lewis and some of the others, of course, dispute and say this is absolute mythology whether it, this is how it was destroyed or not. We simply don't know, as simple as that. However, if you need to take reference to this article, we can do it after the talk, and then you can search it in the library. That's why we are in libraries. And uh, very interesting, and to find Bernard Lewis involved. And Bernard Lewis was defending the Muslims against the others, which doesn't always happen. Yes. It's free of charge this afternoon. <laughs> yeah. The library visitors and users are mostly, so far, students, university students, and uh, you have some researchers who are writers, authors, who are looking for a particular thing which they may know that it does exist at the library or the library helps them find it in other libraries like the Egyptian National Archives or the Tunisians and the Moroccans have very good archives too which often get to be forgotten but they have uh, lots of manuscripts. So this, what the government is doing you know, every year, uh, for instance, in Canada, I think it happens in the U.S., the same thing, where students, high school students, are brought to the national capital on a tour so that they recognize and feel the bond between them and the national capital. So they bring students from all over Egypt to visit the library and learn more about libraries and so on and explain to them. And this is a magnificent step before they really have working libraries at school. So these are the type of people. Tons of tourists. Many of the tourists actually buy library membership cards. And you can buy that on, on like, like mine, they mailed it to me. But you can go there and then they will take your picture and uh, give you a library card just for the fun of it. They're not going to borrow books. Anything else? I'm here. I'm here for another week.
nothing done and being here for Alexander. When I talk to the Alexander, I tell them you should be proud of yourself. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.